Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world. So today I thought I'll show you some of the things that I use to keep my clematis and my roses lush, healthy, insect free and um, sort of disease free, right? And so I'm gonna go over it and if you don't wanna hear about any of this stuff, you can just skip through and go straight to the chore because that's what I'm gonna do next is to show you a little bit of, of sort of how my roses and clematis are looking at the moment, okay? Okay. Um, so this is the food that I use on my roses as well as on my clematis, right? Now it doesn't matter what brand you use really. I've used multiple brands and they all give beautiful results. So um, as long as you use one that has a slightly higher number of phosphorus, which is the middle number, which will promote healthy um, formation of the blooms. And you want to give this in early spring before the roses um, and the clematis leaf out. Now I find that clematis can go without food, but definitely roses need constant feeding um, for lush and healthy formation of the blooms, okay? So you cannot skip it. Um, and like I said, this year, I think I gave it in uh, April because we did have a nice winter and everything started to leaf out earlier. Um, but in other years, I think I might have given it in May, right? So it all kind of depends on when the plants look like they're about to leaf out and that's when you give it so that they have sort of that slow release of food as it grows in the spring, okay? And the other time that I give this food to the roses is at the end of the first flush, which is what we're in right now, near the end of June in our zone, right? So uh, at the end of the first flush, you wanna give it the same amount as you would normally do and that would promote the formation of the healthy blooms that you're gonna get in the second flush, okay? So uh, clematis, I don't usually give it a second feeding except there's just the one feeding in the spring. And like I said, sometimes I also skip the spring feeding for clematis and they still do okay. Uh, compared to the roses, the clematis is not as heavy feeders as the roses, so they can do without a lot of food. So the other thing that I feed my uh, roses it's uh, eggshells, <laughs> uh, not in this form, but uh, powder form of the eggshells. So we do eat a lot of eggs. So I take the eggshells, I put it in the on a baking tray. Um, I bake it for about half an hour at about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then I break it up into small pieces. And then I take this, I put it in the uh, food processors processor sorry uh, or you can use a mortar and pestle and break it up into a fine powder and the reason why you don't want to just put this eggshell in because the eggshells are not soluble in water and it will take a long time for the decomposers to work this into the soil so the smaller you know size of eggshells you have so the finer the eggshells the more surface area you have available for the decomposers to start working it, breaking it apart into the mineral form that the uh, roses and the clematis roots are able to uptake the nutrients from, right? So um, yeah, so I would, like I said, break it up into the powder form. Um, I would give the um, roses and clematis about a half a cup per plant if it's a mature plant. If it's not so mature, I would give it about a quarter of a cup, okay? Um, the other thing that I forgot to mention is I know some of you might be questioning as to why I'm giving the roses that is eggshells um, because you're probably thinking that the rose food probably has enough of this and it does but i just find that roses and clematis put on so much growth in terms of structure building up the you know the canes and the vines that a little boost of uh, the minerals from the eggshell like magnesium and calcium and all those other things that will help in sort of building stronger structure right and that would help so um, that's what I always uh, do to make sure that it has enough of the minerals for the stronger sort of uh, cane and vine growth. Uh, in order to keep your roses insect free, or um, this is what I use. This is the miticide and insecticide soap. It's a concentrate form. Uh, and this, uh, as well as this one, I have both of them and I've used both and they both work just as well. Uh, but this one I think works better on sort of all life stages of the insect, the adult, the eggs, as well as the nymph. 
and um, it controls aphids, white fly, scale, spider mites, mealybugs, caterpillar, beetles, uh, except Japanese beetles, uh, which is what I need something for anyhow. Um, so you can read it all for more information and follow the instructions on here um, for the dilution process. But this one as well, like I said, it works as well. And this one controls aphids, spider mites, white flies, as well as other insects. But it doesn't affect the nymphs and the egg um, stages, right? But but, um, I had to buy this last year because we were in lockdown and all the stores were closed and I had to buy this online and this was the only one that was available but um, I would prefer to use this one like I said because it works on all stages of the uh, life cycle of the insect okay and I just dissolve the same am the amount into a bottle like this and then I use it and I spray it on all the new growth of the roses okay and you do this um, once a week or you have or do it um, more often after, uh, especially after the rain, right? Uh, whenever you have a rain, uh, it's gonna wash out all the soap and you have to reapply this again, just to kind of make sure that the new growth is coated with this stuff so that the insects don't go and start feeding on the new growth, which is what they're attracted to most. Um, the other thing uh, that I also use, and I use this on my clematis actually more often than my roses. Um, I especially because um, I think somebody mentioned that they have clematis uh, wilt, uh, which is I think it's by uh, because of a fungus. So what you do is you t buy this. This is also a fun fungicide and miticide. So you take this, and it's got a different um, sort of opening here. It's just sulfur, garden sulfur, and I like it because it's in the powder garden, um, sort of powder form, which makes it easier to take um, and 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 get into work into the soil. So all I do is I. You can make it into a spray, but I, um, I like to use it directly in the powder form like this, and I just kind of shake it over the root ball of the clematis, and that helps to reduce the, um, the fungus that might result in the clematis wilt, okay? So that's what I normally do for my clematis. Um, and you can use it on your rose as well, especially if you have things like rust or, uh, or, or like this spot, black spots on your rose leaf, right? But in order to prevent this from happening, what I normally do is I water the roses and I water my plants at the root ball. Do not get the leaf wet uh, because every time you get the leaf wet, you're going to wash away the um, the soap, insecticide soap that you just sprayed on the new growth. And also you wash away and, and you will sort of introduce lots of water vapor on the leaf, which also sort of promotes uh, fungal growth, right? So you want to water just at the root ball and avoid watering the leaf altogether. Um, so now I'm gonna show you what I normally do at the end of the first flush, and I'll high, I prune and deadhead the roses. Um, with the pruner that you have, you just wanna make sure that you get a disinfecting wipe and just kind of wipe everything nice and clean. Um, you can wash it with soap, but um, I thought I'd just use the wipe to make it um, sort of nice and clean. And just the handle as well, right? because you never know what you just held and what you just touched. So every new cut, you should uh, clean the blades off a bit so that you don't introduce any disease or any fungus um, into the other parts of the plant if it's infected in one area, because you never know, right? And uh, especially clean between the different plants as well, right? So I chose the stem, I hope you can see it. Um, it's because it's finished blooming, right? It's got all four seed heads that are about to form, except for this one here um, that's gonna be open. Um, so what you, I normally do with this is that I cut the uh, I deadhead the roses right at the top like this like that and then once uh, this last bud has uh, bloom what I normally do is I trace the stem back to the first set of five leaf now as you can see the first set that I come across is the three leaf right now I don't want to cut there because normally uh, with the five uh, leaf that's where you've got a bigger set of blooms that will form rather than here. And so I want to do that. However, with this leaf, you can see that if the stems do form, they're going to form and they're going to come out this way and they'll be pointing to the middle of the rose bush, which is what I don't want because I want the center of the rose bush to be more open, more airy for better airflow. 
so what I do then is I find the next, let me clean this up so you can see better. What I do know is I find the next set of five leaves and you can see that this one here. Actually, can you see that? Okay, I hope you can see this now. Um, so what I do is I find the next set of five leaf on the same stem. So as you can see, um, the first set here, right? That's got the node here. And that the new stem that come out will come out this way. And that will be pointing in the middle of the bush, which is what I don't want. So the next set of buds, uh, leaf buds or five leaf nodes that I see is this one here. And as you can see, if the stems do come out, it will be coming out in the direction of that leaf which will be coming outside of the bush which is what I want so what I normally do is I cut right at the top here and that usually um, it's enough for the uh, plant to bush out so what do you normally do if you get a stem that's like this where it's really really tall right so as you can see that with this what I normally would do is to control the size a bit um, I wait till it finishes flowering and I still do the same thing. Um, actually, let me come a little closer to show you. So here's a close up of this cane that's about uh, actually four feet tall. So when it finishes blooming, uh, you can trace it back all the way to the first set of leaf, um, the five leaf node, which is this one right here. Now I could cut it right up here and it would send out new stem over here and probably here as well. However, even if I cut it back to here, the cane will still be about three feet tall. And to me, I like it a little bit shorter because if the existing cane's already uh, three feet, the new canes that come out, we're just gonna be too sort of messy looking, right? So normally I like to take it down to about two feet and then let it flush out uh, new growth from there on. So I continue, like I said, to trace it back down where I like the cane to be. And I would cut it at the first set of five leaf. And I want, again, you want the five leaf with the node to be pointing outside of the bush, not into the bush. So that when the new cane comes out or new stem, it will come out pointing away from the bush, keeping the middle center of the bush open and airy for better airflow. Okay, I hope that helps. So let's take a look around the garden to see what um, plants are blooming right now. And like I said, the roses are near the end of their first uh, flush or bloom. So they're looking not that great, but there are still some very beautiful blooms. So let's take a look around and see what they're looking like at the moment. Here's one of the baskets that I bought and um, I think it's just looking really, really healthy and lush and full and is starting to trail down the sides of the bat, the hanging basket. So it's looking really, really pretty. And right below here, I've got the burgundy penstemon. Now this one is gigantic. If you take a look at the leaf, it's huge, which is very abnormal. So I'm thinking that it is getting some of the dripping from the excess soluble fertilizer that I feed this basket. But um, anyhow, it is blooming and I also find that it's taller and the blooms came out a little bit later than the other ones that I didn't uh, sort of fertilize. Here's the Eglantine uh, David Austin Rose Bush that's on the west side of the garden. So this one compared to the other one on the east side is a bit taller. You've got lots of canes that are about four feet tall. Um, I think these roses are just much more robust and full this year and as you can see this is just one plant it was full and covered with blooms and if you've seen the other tool uh, you'll see that the beautiful blooms um, were on there and they were covered with them earlier on in the season and um, but there are still some very very beautiful blooms on here so here are some of the blooms that are currently on the eggling ties you can see this one over here it's just recently opened and I think it is gorgeous. And this one as well. See how the formation of the petals and how sort of beautiful the petals look. And they, when they first open, they're a little bit darker blush pink. And as they fade, they become a little bit lighter like this one here. I love this. And then gradually, this is what they look like here. 
it's got uh, still that lighter blush but you can still see how the petals are still looking gorgeous right and here is one that's a bit more mature and you can see it's almost like that sort of whitish blush pink color right and here is a bud that's about to open that's really gorgeous i love love looking at these rosebuds so so pretty and here is an eglantine rosebud that's about to open so you can see that the petals are just about so there are some petals that are already open but you can see this is going to open very soon so probably going to open tonight or tomorrow morning and i love freshly open roses they've got that sort of so sort of beautiful fragrant especially the egg time i think it's one of the most beautiful scent <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, so but I really, really love it. And especially when they first open, they are just really strong. And you can take a waft and, and sniff, and it's just, I don't know, it's, it, it makes you have that sort of feeling like, I don't know, it's hard to describe the smell of roses. Here's a set of uh, blooms that will open very, very soon. So you can see there's one that's been open for a few days right here. And these are huge blooms, love it. And there's tons of buds in here, you can kind of see, right? Lots, and that's just one stem. And then you've got another stem here. You can see, right? Really, really pretty. And here's my uh, Pilu Clematis with the Wester Platy. Now compared to the Pilu, the Wester Platy, uh, which is that burgundy color, it's not as prolific this year for some reason. Probably because the Pilu is taking over and it's like crowding it out, so not able to perform as well. But oh, this Pilu has to be one of my favorite. It's got that nice, beautiful lavender color and also that double sort of bloom now i didn't see a lot of double blooms this year on old wood poly because i pruned it all back so this is all of the new growth that you see here um, and the blooms are on the new growth because the ones from the old growth are actually double and the bubble double blooms are so pretty and like i said this one i think it looks absolutely gorgeous next to the lightfield angel roses it i don't know it just makes you stop breathing for a sec just so that you can inhale and and sort of take in all the beauty of these beautiful gorgeous blooms on here So here's a group of three Lightrio Angel David Austin roses. Now, uh, this has to be like probably the most favorite of my David Austin roses, just because I like its growth habit. It's not too tall, it's about two to three feet tall, and its canes are strong. The blooms are upright, facing up, which I like. And it's got that sort of blush apricot pink when it first opened and then it fades to like a blush apricot color and then it fades to a really really beautiful blush white color and there's a bee in there isn't that gorgeous and here you can see the buds of the two uh, light tree angel roses that are about to open and look at this sight. This has to be one of the best views right now. Look at that. And this isn't the best looking time uh, because they're near the end of the first flush. A few days ago, I think it was looking even more gorgeous. And here's one that literally just opened, I think. Look at that. 
and that the way that the petals shape that, is that gorgeous and the color is just my kind of a color it's got a little bit of pink a little bit of apricot really really gorgeous And here's what the blooms look like after they've opened for a while. So you can see that it loses that pink and it's a bit more peachy apricot kind of a color. And then it fades to this sort of uh, whitish uh, color um, that I think is gorgeous as well. So I think, like I said, all the colors on these blooms from the start to finish, they're all just absolutely gorgeous. can't get over the fact that they are so full and so lush and so full of it this year. I love it. I've been out here for the last, you know, few weeks just taking the scent, taking the sight, taking everything in because like I say, most of these I won't see again till late August when the Japanese beetles have gone through the garden. And the scent on these uh, Lush for Angel blooms are just really nice as well. And I think it's got more of a, a jasmine uh, scent to it, right? That I really like. And also apparently you can see there's lots of bees buzzing around this. So they also attract bees as well, which is really nice. And I think with the combination with the Pilu Clematis, I think it's just absolutely gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Here's a beautiful view as well with the clematis and the roses mingled together. I think that's just really pretty. And you can see all the way to the end of the other side of the garden. Gorgeous. And you can see the Isabel V white blooms. They're just about to open. And it always opens to that sort of slight blush pink, right? And then it slowly, gradually fades to a white and then back to that sort of uh, darker color as well. Here's my burgundy penstemon that's in full bloom. So this one I did not touch um, this year. So it's looking a lot fuller than the other plant here. Here is another look at the three Lightyear Angel Roses with the Pensamen in front. Yes. Oh, and then the background with the Pilu Clematis and the Wesopladi. And then you've got the Maynite Salvia spilling out onto the paper stone. I think it just looks really, really pretty with all the different layering of plants. Right in this middle trellis, you can see that lots of the Mayonnaise salvia is still blooming. And I was hoping for the Giselle, that's a Giselle clematis and the Gencrillidae clematis to be more full like the Pilu. But again, these are just recently planted. This is their second season, so I'm not expecting much, but I'm hoping next year they will put it on a better show. And it'll be a beautiful pink and sort of lavender purple in the background with the salvia blooms right in front. Anyway, that is something to look forward to next year. So here you can see the other three roses that I've gotten this side of the garden. So the Marie Rose is right there um, and it seems like it's a lot taller than last year. And again, I, like I said before, the winter and the past, you know, m months, we've had really beautiful weather. And so they, I think they're a lot more robust and they're a lot taller than what they normally were before. And at the front, I have my Latchfield Angel and it's um, relatively shorter than the Uri Rose. And I've got the um, Evelyn Rose right there in the back. And it's Evelyn Roses. I don't know, but the coloring and the pa 
petal. I keep on saying that it has to be my favorite, but every time I see another bloom of another rose, I end up saying it's my favorite. So actually they're all my favorite, but this one, like I said, it's near the end of it, the blooming um, cycle right now, but you can see there are some still beautiful fresh blooms on here. So here is a um, Evelyn Rose that just literally just opened and you can see that the April color is a lot um, darker than the other, right? It's got more almost like a peachy color to it and this has to be the tightest or the fullest uh, David Austin Rose that I have in the garden. It's got the most petals I would say but it's just the scent. Oh, I think of all the roses I have, the Evelyn must have the strongest scent of them, so beautiful. Oh, there's a tranquility uh, clematis that's bloom blooming right there. And I've got that stem that broke off. I need to cut that off. And here are some more Evelyn roses. And then here you'll see the next color of the Evelyn blooms. So now you can see that it's got less pink in it and more apricot in color, right? And same thing with this one. And then after these two colors, you'll see that it gradually fade to this color here, which I think is gorgeous as well. Really, really pretty. And then it fades to this sort of uh, pinkish, sort of almost that blush pink. It looks very similar to the Eggling Thyme, like these two. You can see these two, right? And then after that, you'll see them fade to this one here which looks to me like the Evening Tine as well. Very pretty, blush pink. And then it fades to a white color. So all the color of the Evelyn Roses are just really, really gorgeous from the start to finish. And here's just a look of all of the blooms from afar. And of all the David Austin roses that I have, I think the Evelyn Rose blooms, it's the fullest. I don't know if I said it before. And also the largest in bloom size as well, I think. It's really, really gorgeous. And here's the Marie Rose. So you can see it's sort of more white than the other roses that I've got, right? So here is a close-up of a Marie Rose bud that just literally just started opening. It's got that sort of um, whitish color looking bud and bloom petals, right? And then this is what it looks like after. It's got that blush, pale, yellowish kind of a color. I think that's really gorgeous as well. So here is a Marie Rose that just recently opened as well. You can see a little bee attracted to it really really gorgeous and then this one is a bit more mature so it's a bit it's less sort of blush yellow it's more of a white color rose at this point and here is a bud gorgeous Now looking at these three roses, I would say that the Marie Rose is very tall and not the canes are not as strong as the other roses. And so the blooms sort of flop a little bit, right? Which is what I don't like. So what I might end up doing next year is maybe put a trellis or something on or an uplisk and let it grow sort of like a climbing rose. But anyhow, I need to figure that out soon. But the Evelyn roses are just absolutely gorgeous. And the Elytra Angel too. So I didn't really show you the Elytra Angel here because I already showed it to you on the other side. But really pretty here too. And here is a salvia that I really, really love. And it's like the, I guess the flowers are huge. And the bloom stalks are just really striking in the color. It's got that deep sort of blue purple color that I really find so attractive. And I think I need to propagate this more. So, so pretty. And here's the other Eggling Tying Rose that's on the west, east side, sorry, of the garden. So this one 
it's not as robust but it is putting on a lot of taller canes and lots of blooms as well so i think this is a little bit behind the other side and here's a gorgeous looking eglantine bud that's about to open Here's one that opened, I think, yesterday. Looking gorgeous, so beautiful. Here's a look of the William Morris roses at their prime right now. Here's one that's about to open. And it goes to this color here. It's really, it's that tight, sort of uh, petal uh, count and look at this one it's about to open very very soon and look at this one isn't that the most beautiful thing I love this so pretty I don't know now that I see these in full bloom I think <laughs> oh goodness every time I see a new bloom I end up saying that I like it because how can you help but look at them how look how sweet they look it's just something that you just can't help but love so much look at that I can't even decide which stage I like the most because I think they're all so so pretty This one that's about to open, or this, oh dear, this. and it's the scent is just beautiful as well. I forget what it smells like last year because I, don't, because I don't think I have, oh I don't, I don't think I had too many blooms on them last year. Both of these are sweet looking as well. And I wish you were here to smell it because that scent is heaven. And I'm not, like I said before, I'm not very good at describing the scent. So, but it's just so strong, and it's I can't explain what it really smells like. But it's just something that you can't help but love, right? And here's the Invincible Wee White that just opened. You see that sort of soft pink color on the blooms? So they first look like that. Do you see a little hint of pinkish petals on there? And they go to this stage here. And then it come, becomes like this. And then like that. And from now on, it's gonna start to become a bit more whitish as it fades well not fades as it brightens up it's just gorgeous i love it and how it complements the beautiful lavender color of the burgundy temperament i just love it and i love how they're early bloomers too right so that's really really gorgeous it's a beautiful blend and even my pink dianthus is starting to bloom as well Cannot wait. And look at this view. I love this. And there's just something about the dark foliage of the penstemon against the invincible wee white blooms and the hosta. And it's just that beautiful how they complement each other. I love it. So here's a view of the garden from where I'm sitting working from home in the backyard in front of these flowers looking out here this is really absolutely gorgeous gorgeous view there's my latchfield angel roses and my eggling thyme and the pilu as well as the baskets gorgeous and here's a close-up of the planter with the bobo hydrangea and the four royal carpet alyssum So these royal carpet alyssum blooms, I think it has to be 
another favorite of mine. It's got that sort of bi color. It's got some white, some light lavender, and some deeper lavender color. I think it just looks so dainty and sort of ethereal. That's the term looking, right? It's so, so magical to me. And the close up is even nicer. Now, Lissom has to be one of my husband's favorite flowers. Now, last year, we recalled, I planted a whole bunch of white ones around the front garden, and he loved that look, and he wanted me to repeat that again. But I thought I'd try something a bit different that's not white, and it, so I thought about the Royal Carpet of Lissom, which I sold from seed. And like I said, I planted four of them in here, and they have put on so much growth that they are starting to make this boba hydrangea look a little bit dwarfish, right? So hopefully once the blooms on the boba come out, because they'll add another three inches or so to each little bloom, making this more proportional, right? Now just as I was coming close to film this, I noticed that it's got a scent. I don't think I've ever noticed a scent on a listen before. I don't know if the white ones have a scent, but these actually have a very, very strong scent to it. Um, I don't know what it is, but I don't think I like it quite as much as the roses. <laughs> anyway, I could be wrong, uh, but I, I'm gonna ask my children and my husband to smell it and see if it's the actual listen, but I notice that it does have a scent to it. And I think I don't like it anyhow, but the flowers is just really gorgeous. And here's a view of the other side of the garden with the Marie Rose, Logical Angel, and the Evelyn. And then the Eglantine as well as the William Morris Rose. My incredible um, hydrangea is just about to open very, very soon. So you can see it's a little bit of a hint of uh, light green to it. That's really gorgeous. I used to have a much bigger bush here, but um, I decided to take most of it out so I could accommodate the uh, cedar, but I'm starting to regret it now, I think, because it used to be this whole entire part here was covered in, in the incredible hydrangea blooms and was absolutely gorgeous around this time. So, but anyhow, it will get bigger. It's looking good. And here's my um, Endless Summer Original Macrophylla Hydrangea. They are, look at the bloom, and so how sweet looking that is. That soft pink. Oh my goodness. This is a sight that I love because last year I think I had, oh dear, maybe one bloom on it. And look how many I have this year. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. And even the little quick fire that I just planted this year, it's starting to bloom too. Oh my dear, oh goodness. I cannot wait to see this soon. You see that? You see some of the infertile petals, blooms? Anyhow, I think I'm gonna say goodbye for now. So I wanna say thank you so, so much for watching this video. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are in the world. Take care. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye for now.